Praise God. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word today? I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And before we read the Word, take your copy of God's Word. Hold it high in the air with me. I mean, say this like you mean it today. Are you ready? Here we go. This is God's infallible Word. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. I will delight myself in it. God's word has the power to change lives. May my life be changed today. Woo! Amen. Matthew chapter 16. Are you ready? Verse 13. First book of the New Testament. Talks about the life of Jesus. Verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? He was referring to himself. They replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, figures, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Heavenly Father, thank you for your divine revelations that you speak into people's hearts. And God, we are 2,000 years removed from the time that you walked the sands of Galilee but yet you are very much alive and well. And as you spoke back then, you speak today. As you revealed yourself back then, you reveal yourself today. And God, we want to be in a position to see your glory. Hallelujah, in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share with you today, uh, I, I call this message divine revelation. This sounds like, ooh, but it really is very practical for believers today. Divine revelation. The passage that I read to you I find extremely interesting. This took place at a time where Jesus was well into his ministry. And I find it very appropriate that Jesus talks about his identity at Caesarea Philippi. Because Caesarea Philippi was formerly called Paneus, which was named after the Greek god Pan, who was the god of the forest for the Greeks. And then later on, the name was changed to recount Caesar Augustus and Herod Philip, Roman leaders. And so here's Jesus, a very appropriate location for him to talk about who he is to his disciples to prove himself far above and beyond the Greek gods or the Roman leaders. The God that we serve has no comparison, my friend. Amen? So he turns to his disciples and he asks them this question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Hmm. And they replied with a conglomeration of all these rumors that are flying out there because there were rumors flying out there about who Jesus was. Well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say that you are one of the prophets. But they weren't quite getting where Jesus was going with this. But Jesus said, but you, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Wow. Simon Peter pipes right up. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Wow, he hit the nail right on the head. There was no ambiguity whatsoever with that. To which Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but how? But by my Father in heaven. By my Father in heaven. Jesus goes on to say that the declaration of what Peter had just spoken uh, he would build his church upon that. So, in other words, Jesus was saying to Peter, Peter, in order for you to really get who I am, in order for you to understand who I really am, you had to have received a divine revelation about that. God spoke to your heart. God spoke it deep to his heart. So, we're talking about divine revelation. I want to give you several points this morning. What do I mean by a divine revelation? Let's define it. The divine revelation is when God makes something real to your heart. Normally, it would be up on the screen. It'll be up there soon, I'm sure. But a divine revelation is when God makes something very, very real to your heart. When Jesus drives it home to your spirit, okay? 
Have you ever had that where God just spoke a divine truth to you and He just drove it home to you? Scripture says that now we look through a glass darkly. It's like putting on dark sunglasses. You can see, but it's a little, little dim. The Bible talks about there's a veil over our face right now. But thank God, every once in a while, God takes a veil and He pulls it back and lets us see Him in all of His glory, in all of His splendor and power. Those times where He says, Behold me! This is what I'm doing. This is who I am. This is my power. He becomes so real and so clear to us as He directs our steps. He wants to reveal Himself to His people. You know, I, I think about... Something that disturbs me greatly as a pastor is, I wonder how many people come to an altar at a church, be it this church or any other church, and they pray, they pray typically what we would call a sinner's prayer. They pray that prayer, but then they get up and they go their own way and they do their own thing and you never see them in church again. What happened there? What happened there? Well, they believed it in their head but they never truly had that divine revelation of who Jesus is. When someone gets saved and genuinely saved, it's far more than admitting that Jesus died on the cross. You're saved when suddenly the glorious truth of the Gospel, it dawns in your heart. It becomes yours. It becomes personal to you. Jesus drives it deep into your heart. It becomes alive in you. Will you know that you know that you know that Jesus loves me so much that He died on the cross for me in my place. He wants me to be with Him so much. He doesn't want anything to stand between us. And so by the grace and mercy of God, he forgave all of my sins, all those horrible things I have ever thought or done. And He has washed them away as far as the east is from the west. And He has gloriously done that. And He makes me His own. And now I belong to Jesus Christ. My friend, now that's salvation. That's a divine revelation of who God is. And you will not walk away from that. You cannot walk away from that. You will determine that you will serve Him all the days of your life. When that takes place in your heart, my friend, that's what salvation is. When God reveals this is who I am and you accept me. In Matthew 4, Jesus calls His first disciples. I want you to picture this. Okay, we're along the shores of Galilee. Now, here, here are the waves coming in. Anybody, anybody can make wave sounds coming in like... Okay, I feel the waves. The fresh wind blowing on me, okay? Picture it with me. Jesus is walking along the shores of Galilee and He sees two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. And these two guys are doing what they had done a thousand times before. They're casting their net out into the sea to try to catch some fish. And from the shore, Jesus says, Hey guys, come and follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And it says to me, this is amazing, it says, at once they left their nets and they followed Him. Picture that. At once... They left their nets and they followed him. I don't know if they jumped out of the boat and swam to shore or got the boat to shore or what, but they left their nets behind and they followed Jesus. Then he comes to three other men. It was a father-son operation here. The boat probably said Zebedee and sons fishing. I don't know. But it was Zebedee and his two sons, James and John. And Jesus speaks to the two boys. And he tells them to follow him. And it says that they left their boat and their father and followed him. That's pretty incredible to me. Now, I, I must admit before this in John chapter 1, that indicates that these people probably had some limited access to Jesus before this event takes place. But picture this. All these guys I'm talking about are professional fishermen. Their lives were devoted to catching fish. But here's the question that I ask when I read that passage. How is it that all Jesus had to do was to walk up and say, follow me, and I'll make you fish as a man. And right then and there, they just dropped everything. And what could possibly, possibly make that happen? Was it a case of kind of like a spiritual zombies or hypnosis? I must follow Jesus. No. Was it a case of, you know, I'm sick and tired of fishing anyway. I smell like fish all the time. I'm scraping fish scales out of my ears and I step on these fish heads when I walk down the path to go home and that hurts when I do that. So I'm tired of fishing. What have I got to lose? I might as well follow Jesus. No, that's not what happened. Was it with James and John, you know, their fathers, they, they are often called the sons of thunder, and there's some supposition that their father Zebedee was a very angry man, and so I can picture them out in the boat, and their dad says, you sissies, 
Pull that net up. My grandmother could do it better than you. And so maybe James and John said, man, we've had enough of dad. We're through with dad. And so, yes, we'll leave our nets and we'll follow you, Jesus. Can I tell you, none of those are acceptable. None of those happened. It did not happen for any reason like that. Then what could have suddenly compelled them to leave everything behind to follow Jesus? I'll tell you what it was. It was a divine revelation. God spoke to their hearts. The Spirit of God spoke to them and said, you know, this really is the Messiah, the Savior, the long-awaited One. There was a sense of awe that the miracle worker was walking among them, that the Son of God Himself was in their midst. And so they knew something inside of them said, with everything that is within us, we must follow Jesus. A divine revelation God spoke to their heart, said, this is the One this nation has been waiting for. Get on board and follow Him. God made it so real to them, no doubt in their mind, that they would never, ever, ever, ever be the same again. Wow. Some things about divine revelations we need to understand. See, God spoke back then. God still speaks today. Amen? So, But we need to understand that a modern-day divine revelation will never contradict what He has already said in God's Word. That's a foundational thing when we're talking about this. We've got to get that. In other words, he will never tell a woman, go and divorce your church-going husband because he's boring or because he plays golf too much. God will not say that to you. That is not a modern-day divine revelation. God will never tell you to forget about the widows and orphans. Oh, just let them fend for themselves. No, that's contrary to God's Word. He will never tell you anything like that. He won't be telling you, well, you don't have to go to church. You don't really need it. Just do your own thing. Just do the YouTube evangelist roulette thing and wherever your finger falls, just watch that evangelist today. My friend, if if you think God's speaking to you along those lines, somebody's speaking to you, but it's not God. It's the devil speaking to you along those lines because he will not do that. If you you get that, it's probably because you've been eating too many burritos or something. It's it's not because God is speaking to you. And let me say this. If you wondering, am I really receiving this from God? There are times where you should probably go to a, to a peer or to a mentor of yours and share what you believe God is speaking to your heart and get some help from them because maybe they will be able to help confirm that in your heart, my friend. So very important. God will never contradict what he said in his word. His word is forever established. Uh, it, it infuriates me when there are churches around that, that will tell you, well, what happens in our service supersedes the Word of God. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The Word of God is God's Word, first and foremost. Can you say amen? Amen. Next thing is you cannot get away from a divine revelation. Joseph in the Old Testament, you remember him, son of Jacob, Joseph in the Old Testament, he received a divine revelation one day that said, one of these days, your parents and your brothers are going to bow down before you. Now that was very odd to Joseph because here he was, probably the least respected among all of his siblings, one of the youngest ones indeed. And later on, his brothers hated him so much that they threw him in a pit and left him for dead. But when they did that, Joseph didn't give up. And when he was sold as a slave to the Midianite caravan that was passing through, his confidence in that divine revelation did not wane. It did not falter. Later on, when Pharaoh had him thrown in prison, he still believed in that divine revelation. And then God gave him supernatural wisdom, I believe, to know what Egypt should do when the famine was about to come. And so because of that, God elevated him to the number two man in all of Egypt. And it wasn't long before his brothers came down because the famine had hit Israel. His brothers came down from Israel to Egypt and without even recognizing that this was their brother, they bowed down to him and asked him for food for their family. And so that divine revelation came true. But the point is, no matter what Joseph had to go through, all those difficult things he went through, he did not give up on the divine revelation. And when God speaks to your heart, do not give up on what you believe God has spoken to your heart. Somebody say amen out there. See, when God gives you a divine revelation, it will constantly be with you. It'll be with you when you wake up in the morning, be with you when you go to bed at night. Oh, there may be a few days when you don't think about it, but very soon it's going to come back. He may be speaking to you about different things, about ministry or whatever, but it will always come back to your heart. You cannot escape it. Now, I want to give you, a, give you a caution here that's very important. What you believe God is speaking to your heart, if, if it ever stops being real to you, 
one of two things has happened. Number one, either it wasn't a divine revelation in the first place, it was originated in your heart, in your mind, because if it's from God, it's going to keep coming back to you. And number two, if that goes away from you, it's a very sad thing that's taking place because that means that your heart that was once tender has now become so hard that God can't get His message through to you anymore. He's knocking, but you're just not answering anymore. And friend, that is a dangerous place to be. Don't keep putting God's divine revelation for your life. Maybe it's something He's calling you to, something He wants you to do. Don't you keep putting that on the back burner. There comes a time where you've got to step out in faith and do what God is calling you to do. Or your heart becomes harder and you will not hear from God as easily as you did before. That's a challenge that your pastor is issuing today. It, it did my heart so good this past week. Someone in our church who's in this service this morning uh, was involved in a certain ministry. And when they were done with that ministry this week, they came to me and said, Oh, Pastor, I know for sure that this is what God wants me to be doing with the rest of my life. See, that's a divine revelation. They know it's from God about what God wants them to be doing with their life. That's exciting. God wants to do that today. So let me, let me put it this way. Let me make this crystally clear to all of us today. God wants to give you a divine revelation. Point to somebody next to you and say, God wants to give you a divine revelation. Come on, do it all. Come on, everybody. God wants to give you a divine revelation. Who, me? Yes, you. Maybe it's something that God is calling you to do. Maybe he's laying out a, a ministry or ministry involvement that, that you know did not come from you. You know it came from God. I remember the day God set my future for me. I had a general idea. I was doing my best. I was recently saved, recently found Christ as my Savior, and I was doing my best to follow the Lord. But there came a day when God spoke to my heart in unmistakable terms. This was God's divine revelation to me. And he basically said that day, yes, what you have been suspecting is my will, is indeed my will. I am calling you into the ministry. I know, and God's, God, God has all the answers. He said, I know you don't think you can do it, but you're not doing this alone. You're doing it with me, and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He said, I know you think, why me? And I say, why not you? Yes, you. And, and he urged me to utterly abandon myself to the will of God. And I would not fail. I would not falter. And God said, I will accomplish all that I send you to do. And I thank God for that. I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that God spoke to my heart. No one could dissuade me from that. Matter of fact, I told my pastor at the time that God was calling me and I needed to take off to Bible college. And he didn't want me to go because I was his right-hand man. He was, not, he was not saying that I wasn't called, but he, he didn't want me to go. But I could not let my pastor, who I respected greatly, I could not have, let him keep me from the call of God that was upon our li my life. I had to do what I believe God spoke to my heart. Hallelujah. And here, 40 years later, I'm still at the plow and we're still moving forward in Jesus' name. And I believe God is doing a great work. Amen. So a divine revelation, maybe for you, it's about what he wants to do in your family. Do you think God wants to do anything in your family today? Man, you've got a real mess on your hands in your family. Your family, things seem to be going from bad to worse. But oddly enough, there's a sense of dramatic peace in your life. A peace in your heart. Because God has told you, God has shown you that what you are seeing now is not the final chapter for your family. The final chapter is yet to be written. What you're seeing ongoing right now is not what always shall be. There is more to come. And God is saying to you, though I am moving now in ways you cannot see behind the scenes, there is coming a day shortly that I will be moving in ways that you can see. And God is encouraging you today. Be at peace. Hold steady. Keep doing what you know to do. Believe because I have everything under control. Maybe God wants to give you a divine revelation about what He wants to accomplish in your family, my friend. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Any, any of your family, any of you have families that say, man, my family needs to hear from God. Wow. God needs to show up in my family. Amen. Amen. Let me give you a scripture today that for some reason, it has always captivated me. I think it's because of the pastor that's in me. It's Psalm 110, verse 3. I want to read this scripture to you in two different versions so we get a rounder understanding. First of all, in the King James, it says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauty of holiness. 
Then let me read the same scripture in the NIV, New International Version. Your troops be, will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Here's my understanding of that passage. I, I, I know that pastors always have a tension within them, feeling the need to raise up more leaders. It's always about raising up leaders. Uh, we feel sometimes like a recruiter, and that's a horrible feeling to have. We realize, though, we're smart enough to know as pastors that we can't do what God is calling us as a church to do alone, that we all need to rise up. And so that can be a tough thing sometimes. And, and, and as pastors, we see in the spiritual realm, I'm just going to be very honest with you today, we see in the spiritual realm the places this church could be, could be if people stepped up into the ministry that God is calling them to. We see that. We, we see how God wants to give people a, a hunger for missions like never before. He wants to give some people a hunger for discipleship that they can help teach, to, teach young Christians the way of the Lord. He wants to give some people a, a hunger for, for missions team, for outreach, for teaching about parenting, for developing our social media here, a passion for worship, to be on fire, to be on the worship team. He wants to speak to people's hearts along those ways, my friend. But I believe what this verse is primarily saying is when God shows up in all of His power and glory, when, we, when He reveals Himself, when we begin to see Him move, then you better look out because there will not be any way that you can keep God's people from stepping up and saying, I'm one of those, I want to be used of God. The people will find their place in the church and the kingdom of God. And so what do we need as a church? See, we need, you know, we could say we need programs, we need systems, we need this, we need that. But what we need more than anything else is a divine revelation where Jesus Christ shows up in big ways and that will take care of everything, my friend. That will take care of everything. Amen. Biblical quiz time. The fifth book of the New Testament is Acts. Now, for those of you, and I, I'm saying this, it sounds funny to some of you, but seriously, some people may not understand. It's, it's the book of Acts, but it's not A-X-E. Okay? Although Paul got the X in the end, but it's A-C-T-S. But more appropriately, more definitively, the book of Acts is called the Acts of, and now maybe in your Bibles, if you open up to that first page, it may say the Acts of the Disciples or the Acts of the Apostles. That's not even accurate. I believe it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, similarly, what is the name of the last book of the Bible? Revelation. Your Bible probably goes on if you look at that first page of that book to more accurately say this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that is indeed a better and fuller name, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let me put it this way. Right now, there are a lot of people who pay little attention to Jesus. And many of you know some of those people. How many, how many of you know somebody that Jesus doesn't really mean a thing to them? Okay? They're all over the place out there. To some people, all Jesus is is a curse word. Right? We've heard that before. Secularists would claim that Jesus is nothing more than a crutch for the emotionally weak. Some people out there would at least admit that Jesus, well, yeah, I do believe he was a prophet, but he was just like any other prophet. Many in our society have little room in their daily thought life for anything about Jesus. But can I tell you, one day, all of that is about to change. The day that God's cup of wrath is full, the day that the Scriptures are all fulfilled when the time is right, one day, on a day that starts off like any other day, Jesus Christ is going to be coming in the clouds of glory and believers everywhere will rise to meet Him and millions upon millions of people will be missing and the people of this world still will not get it. Even then, some will say it was an alien invasion. It was a massive airlift. Some will say it was some some kind of time warp that we don't understand. Some will say it was a black hole in outer space that sucked people away. But then, oh then, Jesus Christ will come on a white horse with the armies of heaven with Him. And on His garment and on His thigh, there will be a name written that will say King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And He will conquer the enemy. And He will bind him up. And He will throw him in the bottomless pit. Hallelujah. And that's not the good news yet. And the good news is, 
He will set up his kingdom, creating a new heaven and a new earth, and he will reign forever and forever and forever. And the Spirit of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And on that day, he will be revealed as the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He will be revealed as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Almighty One, the Everlasting One, the Son of the living God. And on that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you if that if some of you may be like, whoa, where did he get that? Revelation 19 and other chapters around there, read that. Here, here's the point I wanted to make with that. One day he will reveal himself to the sin darkened world. I mean, on that day there's going to be no doubt. Okay? But until that day, he continues to reveal himself to his people and to those who have hungry hearts. Can we be both of those categories today? Can we be his people? And can we be those who have hungry hearts? God, I need to hear from you. I need a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. Could the worship team come, please? See, God still moves, God still speaks. The question is, not is God trying to reveal himself. The question is, are you ready for him to reveal himself to you? Scripture says, he that hath an ear to hear, what? Let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto him. So we have to have ears to hear. We have to have ears to receive this divine revelation. How do we have ears to receive what God wants to speak to us? How do we have those kind of ears? Number one, is we've got to block out all the other sounds. We live in a world that is very disruptive to us. We live in a world that has voices all over the place. You, and I'm not talking about hearing voices in your head here. I'm talking about you're driving down the road and there are billboards shooting messages at you. There are TV shows that aren't just, aren't just harmless comedy, but they're shooting messages at you. Commercials that are trying to get you to believe a certain way. Co-workers that are trying to get you to lean this way politically or that way spiritually. You have all kinds of voices all around you, my friend, and you've got to be able to block them out. I remember, remember the story about the two sisters, Martha and Mary. And here's Martha. Jesus is coming to their house. Oh, I've got to chop up the lamb. I've got, to, I've got to get the fire going. I've got to go fetch water. I've got to get the sticks for the fire. I've got to, I've got to get the weed. I've got to knead the dough. I've got to do this, got to do that. And here's her sister Mary just sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, Martha says, Make Mary do some work. To which Jesus responds, but Mary has found the best thing. And that's to block out all the busyness and focus on Jesus. Sometimes we need to do that. I realize we live in a world that we have to, we have to work. We have to do things. I, I get that. But to the best of your ability, begin to block out all the garbage that doesn't matter. I was telling somebody this week and they were talking about something. I said, I don't even have time to think about that. I don't even want to think about that because that's disruptive. Let's go on to what Jesus has. For you. Block those out. And then secondly, if you want to hear, if you want to receive what God has for you, you need to tune him in. You know, the, the old radios before the digital age in the day of analog, you used to have to take that knob and just find that station just right on the dial if it was going to be any good. How many of you remember those days, right? But you, you had to tune that in. And God wants you to tune Him in through devotions and through reading the Word of God. So I challenge all of us today. The exciting thing that I tell you today is God wants to give you a divine revelation. But have an ear and a heart to receive what God has for you. He's trying to speak to you. He's trying to reveal Himself to you in a new and powerful way. Are you ready to allow Him to do that? Could we just bow our hearts in the presence of the Lord right now, please?